Chapter 5, Boxes, Birthday, and Honey and Orange. Something out of the ordinary just happened. Ben and I were asked by Emma to carry boxes of supplies that were delivered here not too long ago. When we first arrived at the camp, we were specifically told that we wouldn't be a part of the delivery process. As proven by this request of Emma's, that rule is clearly not something they're firm with any longer. Truthfully, it makes me wonder why. I look at the piles of boxes. It's no surprise Ben and I were the ones chosen for the job. We're probably the two guys Emma is closest to in our building. When we arrive where we were told to meet her, we are greeted by her usual smile. Good afternoon. Hey. Morning. I look over at the massive pile of boxes and nod in their general direction as I speak. I guess we'll be stuck here a while. It was either this or them sitting out here all day. In fact, they were simply dropped here without a word. I wasn't even to... She cuts herself off and gives me an apologetic smile with an end of regret. I'm sorry. It's not my place to speak on these matters. These words make me beyond curious, which is probably the opposite of what she intended. But I've already decided not to press her on this matter. I would want her to get in trouble for gossiping about things she's not allowed to share. Ben notices her sudden discomfort and speaks. Let's get started, shall we? We want to get stuck here all day. Let's. Emma nods and gives us instructions on where to place each different type of box. We soon get started in lifting. Emma soon gives up, something which I can't blame her for due to her their weight. These boxes seem stuffed with various types of produce. Some rattle when you pick them up, others clearly contain liquid products, and some are entirely solid. Luckily, these are only for our building. Moving them to another building would be a project on an entirely different level. After about half an hour, the pile has been reduced to half its original size. Halfway there. The sweat is rolling down my forehead, however. I once again am thankful for keeping in distant shape since I got here. This stuff would have hurt me for days had I not been used to straining my body. Ben seems like he's keeping up with my pace, so I'm sure he's on a similar routine. Do you work out, Ben? Ben puts down the box he's carrying, leans on it for a bit, and replies. I try to. You never know what to ask the next day I had in store. Ben nudges the boxes and laughs. You? I try to. I flash him a grin. Honestly, living so close to nature and everything that entails, I wouldn't feel confident being able to deal with my daily chores if I weren't used to hard work. Nor would I feel safe if, well, if anything was to happen. I'm inclined to agree. In our old lives, we had police, ambulance, and firemen one phone call away at all times. But the circumstances of this camp, in a sense, were more exposed than we've ever been. Be prepared for unfortunate things. Had to happen seems like a natural thing to do when you don't have a lifeline to call away. As they do happen. Unfortunate things, that is. Not to say that we're out here all by ourselves. There's Daniel and his team, but I feel like I see them less with every passing day. Maybe that's got something to do with why we're here today, helping Emma and not them. You're right. You can't hurt to be prepared. Yep. We should get the girls to get into their get into a routine as well. It's not a half bad idea. I'll talk to Charlotte. You talk to Lorelai. Sure. I'm pretty sure Lorelai already keeps in shape. It could be an interesting topic to bring up. I make a mental note of it. Ben nods at me, picks up his boxes, and continues his work. His back is as covered in sweat as mine is. This is hard work, and it shows. Moreover, it feels. Now that I've stood still for a while, I can sense both my arms and legs involuntarily trembling. There's still half of the pile left. After carrying an especially heavy box, I return outside once again. I wipe sweat off my forehead and take a few deep breaths as I lean against a nearby wall. On a bench not too far away, and to my surprise, I see Lorelai sitting with a parasol in her hands. She seems to be enjoying the weather, and the sight of us suffering, I imagine. When she notices my stare, she gives me a provo provocative smile. Just you wait. 
Once I've exposed the others to how overqualified for this type of work you are, you'll be suffering right here with us. We soon finish up the work here and thus dismiss by Emma. As a reward, we're each given a chocolate bar. It's been a while since I last had candy. I try to think of a place to sit down and rest and enjoy it. I remind him of Lorelai sitting at the bench outside. Ben has already returned to his room, so it's an attractive option. I head right back outside. With sweat rolling down my warm back from today's hard work, I sit down beside Lorelai. The sun is approaching the horizon with every minute that passes. We're slowly heading towards sunset, and the sun's descent marks that change in time. Lorelai still holds her parasol as the wind gently rocks it back and forth in a fluctuating manner. Rough day? She displays a coquettish smile as she asks me this question. More so than yours, I see. Hey now, it was plenty painful to watch you guys suffer. I groan. How about you help out next time? Me? But I'm just a weak girl who has no business lifting heavy boxes. I raise my eyebrows at her. Don't be ridiculous. My secret identity as the Superwoman would have been revealed. The Superwoman, eh? Lorelai blushes slightly. Well, something like that. I look at her intently. It was a joke, you know. Stop staring at me. She's so easy to deal with sometimes. All I have to do in situations like these is wait, and then watch her self-destruct. I laugh. I guess the Superwoman stays in shape, then. Ben and I talked briefly about that just now. She does. I try to find time each day for exercise. Though lately my exercise has been quite simple, which I don't really mind, I guess. After all, the most important part is that I don't do nothing. Also, don't call me that. I don't like it anymore. Call me that again, and I'll hurt you. I guess the su y You don't want to bite at this, then. I take the chocolate bar from my pocket and dangle it in front of her face. I can see her gulping. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say no to such a generous offer. I haven't had lunch, so... I laugh at her some more. She hits my shoulder. Hard, I might add. Fucking hurts. I gently squeeze the chocolate bar with my fingertips. It's already getting soft from being exposed to direct sunlight. It's already melting. You better eat it fast. The sunlight. You can always come under the parasol, you know. It probably wouldn't melt as fast, and you can hold the parasol for me, right? I move right over to her. Her shins are touching. Her skin is pleasantly cold and unbelievably smooth. If you wanted me to come closer, you could have just said so. She instantly gets flustered and looks away. Not denied it, I see. I open the chocolate bar and pop half of it into my mouth. The buttery filling and the rich chocolate it was covered by spreads around my mouth with each bite. Delicious. The remaining half in the wrapping I hand over to Lorelai. Well, um, thanks. I smile. It's more like a grin in all honesty. But if I told her that, I'd be done for. She looks content as she nibbles away at her half of the bar. On this bench, with my scalding leg meeting her cool skin, Lorelai, Lorelai and I have a lengthy chat about dumb things, important things, and everything in between. The past. The present. The future. What went wrong? What went right? And what can be done differently? No matter the seriousness of the subject, though, these talks with Lorelai are important to me. Our conversations are important. I feel like I'm getting closer to what I'm looking for. We enjoy the chilling evening air, slowly filling up the basin that is the camp until we get hungry enough to find us some dinner. As we get up and leave the bench for the night, she flashes me a smile that would brighten anyone's day. Not once did she ask me to hold the parasol for her. I hope you'll enjoy it. She is radiant. Her golden heart, 
once again makes an appearance. She intently looks at us with her large eyes. With her entire being, she wishes for us to enjoy the meal she made. That much is clear. I look over at Lorelai. Her features certainly look a bit softer than usual in the warm evening light. I think we're all enjoying this a lot. This reminds me of family dinners. Sure does. Ben is devouring Emma's homemade soup, and just for just a moment, I feel like he's returned to his young self. He's enjoying the food with childlike expressions and manners. It's a delightful sight that tugs at my heartstrings for some reason. I look down at my own portion and soon after and soon after scoop up a spoonful. Sometimes you have to experience things yourself before you truly realize what people meant by their words of wisdom. You might have understood the words uttered by that same person, but you can only go as far as to attempt to imagine their true meaning. This meal truly feels like it was made with love, and indeed the meaning of the very concept is clear to me now. I could have asked for a nicer meal than this. Does the birthday boy have anything to say now that we're all gathered? She's as playful as ever. I feel a bit baffled, desperately trying to think of something clever to say. Charlotte looks intently at me with a teasing glint in her eyes. I give up shortly after and decide to simply speak what my heart's been whispering to me all this time. You're my friends, and I appreciate you all. You guys matter to me, and I want you to know that. Lastly, thank you for keeping me company on my birthday. Short and sweet. Moreover, the words accurately reflect my feelings. Charlotte's previous expression fades away promptly, and instead turns soft. Moments pass in silence, with their stares on me, but I feel no regret. Ah, Quentin! Charlotte exhales loudly as she puckers her lips slightly. The only one visibly tearing, tearing up is Emma. Lorelai gently puts her hand on her back, yet turns away for reasons. Or so I assume. Ben grabs my shoulder and gives me a firm squeeze. You're very welcome. And I hope you realize this means we're doing this exact same thing for my birthday. He says so with a smirk. This is his way of strengthening our relationship. It's important to him that I agree to his terms. Looking forward to it. Oh, you bet. I demand a proper party, and he'll be my go-to guy for arranging it. Naturally. Soon, everyone finishes their servings and, with a handful of genuine thanks to Emma, begin to slowly return back to their previous occupations. Emma looks at ease. She smiles at me gently as her eyes meet. Thank you, Emma. I realize we're the only ones left. I nibble on some of the remaining corn in the bottom of my bowl. It's full of flavor from the rich broth. Delicious. I peek over at Emma once again. You're too kind sometimes. Our eyes meet yet again. Then I look down, over at Emma's bowl. Her gaze follows mine. It seems that in her hurry to please everyone, she forgot to eat her own portion. She realized what I've observed and makes a somewhat surprised expression. Oh. Want me to warm it up for you? No, after all, it's your bird. I get up without waiting for her to finish her sentence. She's always the one to service us to the best of her ability. The least I can do is make sure she gets a warm meal herself. I move over to pick up her bowl. As I do exactly that, what a sweet smell. Surprisingly sweet, even for someone like Emma. Refreshing and truthfully gorgeous. I almost feel enamored. Is that your hair? Just slightly, instantly understand what I made a remark about. It's my homemade shampoo. I used honey and orange in making it. I'm quite happy with how it turned out. You should be. It smells amazing. As if her cheeks were red enough, they got even redder. In this moment, no sane person would think it's an exaggeration to call her excessively cute. I'm 
almost feel guilty just looking at her. I walk over to the kitchen. Warming up shouldn't take long. I put it back into the pot it was boiled in. It doesn't take too long until the soup begins to move around under the surface. It's hot enough. I walk back outside with her warm bowl in my hands. There she sits at the table, all alone, unaware of my eyes on her. She looks at peace in the evening sun, but I sense something conflicting in her expression. Warming up your soup is indeed the least I can do for you. I don't know what burdens your heart carries, but you're a kind soul to the core. She knows it's my presence. Her face lights up. But that vague darkness somewhat lingers in her otherwise flawless smile. May your soup made with love help ease the pain. Here you go. Thank you. I'm not going to sit here and watch you eat, so how about I start taking in the dishes? Or, would you prefer if I kept you company after all? This time I don't interrupt her, because I want her to ask me to unburden her heart, if only a little. Could you perhaps keep me company instead? I wait a moment before sitting down. I look at her with a gentle smile. Sure thing. She doesn't reply, for it seems she's lost in thought. Before we get the chance to say anything, she opens her mouth. I can trust you, can I not? I nod. There's... something I feel the need to vent about. And things could turn out quite bad if people knew. About my doubts. So it's of crucial importance that you keep quiet about what I'm about to tell you. Doubts? Could you possibly be referring to... I don't feel at home. This doesn't feel right. Making people happy makes me happy in the moment, but as soon as they leave, I wonder what I'm really doing here. What we're really doing here. What in the world are we doing out here, Quentin? I see. So even you are in the dark about the circumstances of this camp. You poor thing. You're not the only one. She looks at me with a hint of shock in her eyes. Here I thought you were going to convince me that everything's alright. I don't know. It seems it isn't, huh? No, not at all. Not at all. In fact, I feel like a mere puppet following Daniel's orders. It's just not right. She moves a finger up to her face to catch a tear rolling down. I sit down next to her and grab her shoulder firmly. You're not alone in this world. In this very moment, I make a decision. After I've consulted for a bit, I slowly start telling her what a, about what Lorelai and I have been up to. Bit by bit, I test the water to see her reaction to each piece of information I'd let her onto. The deeper we get into the conversation, the more I'm hoping I won't regret this. She is, after all, affiliated with those who brought us here. If I made an error in judgment in trusting her, could turn out quite bad for both me and Lorelai. But ultimately, I just don't see this backfiring on me. This is Emma we're talking about, possibly the kindest person at this camp. She simply can't be something anything other than the Emma I see when I look at her. I finish my detailed explanation about both our current and future plans. I can't deny it. Explaining all the details in this manner makes me feel vulnerable. However, she looks determined. In return, her determination fills me with determination. I made the right decision. I know I did. Her soft voice is indeed determined. I'll happily help you guys out however I can. Behind the scenes or otherwise, I'll do my best to be of help to you. That's right. Being able to rely on her help will probably prove incredibly useful. Laurel and I, Lorelai and I will now have the freedom to come and go as we want, for starters. Glad to hear it. I feel relieved having brought another person into this, but at the same time, I feel myself feeling conflicted. A new concern has come into play. If things don't go our way, any negative consequences for Emma are on my conscience. I'm anxious, not because of the possibility of Emma ratting us out, but because I fear I've gotten her into something I shouldn't have. For now, 
I have to prepare to face Lorelai with this new piece of information. Later that evening, when I return towards my room after taking a long walk, something has happened that makes me freeze up in panic. A pair of markings I always leave on my door have been moved. Yes, this does indeed mean someone's been inside my room. I quickly look around me, but the corridors are empty. I hate having to rely on chance when it comes to the safety of where I sleep. I'm really hoping no one's found out about her doubts about this place, or else I might not be like that guy that tried to escape the first night. Not that I really know what happened to him, but my imagination goes places. Then again, there is no reason to su suspect me of anything. That is, assuming Emma didn't spill the beans about our talk immediately. Though, even if they had found out I'd been poking around in matters that do not concern me, nothing truly bad could realistically happen. Right? And that's just assuming they have. I firmly believe the chances are slim. I'm too paranoid for my own good. Shit. Should I go seek refuge in Lorelai's room, or just pretend that I didn't notice the marks? On second thought, somehow, I suppose they could be observing me right now, so I need to act suspicious. My thoughts are jumbled and conflicted. No matter what I assume in this moment, the last thing I want is to attract attention to Lorelai and myself, and Emma too, I suppose. I step into my room. It's empty. A surprisingly pleasant smell lingers in the room, though. A fragrance whose origin I cannot pinpoint. Nothing seems out of place. As I think exactly that, I see something that, without a doubt, stands out. I react quickly. I turn on the light, sigh deeply, and rub my face in disbelief. On my desk sits a small bottle along with a note. Emma. Hello, Quentin. I hope you don't mind that I used the master key to enter your room. Since you weren't in, I figured I would take myself the liberty. You seem to like my homemade, my handmade shampoo so much I figured I would give you a bottle of your own as a belated birthday present. This one is the same blend I used earlier today, honey and orange. I have many more blends in the workings. I hope you like it. Bye for now, Emma. I laugh at my own stupidity. Well, perhaps my suspicions were warranted, but it appears I am way too tense. Too tense to even consider something reasonable like this. But thank you, Emma. I let out a sigh. No one should be, should, no one should be suspicious of me, because I've done nothing to be suspicious of. Or that's what it should look like if I cover my tracks properly. I feel like acting too paranoid may surely be my downfall at this rate. Perhaps I'll head out into the forest tomorrow. Seems I might need something of this sort to get me away from all this for a while. I head to bed, trying my hardest not to think about what could have awaited me in this room. Chapter 6, Sand Through Fingers